Right. Hi. Welcome, everyone, to this SID session. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging that we're on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years, and acknowledge and pay our respects to their elders past and present. That much I'm supposed to say, but I'd like to add that uh, you can consider Australia as an informal settlement. If informality, you can think of illegality in the sense that the land has never been ceded. So uh, this is an invaded land that I am actually sitting on right now. Um, okay, having said that, uh, we have, uh, this is the last SEED session. So those of you who are joining us for the first time, SEED uh, stands for Space for Engagement and Epistemic Diversity. It's a platform hosted for uh, early career researchers and doctoral students at the Informal Urbanism Research Hub uh, at uh, University of Melbourne. Uh, so uh, throughout the year, we have uh, tried to arrange, a, uh, we have tried to arrange a, a monthly symposium, uh, kind of like a more informal symposium. Uh, we have had that. So if you go to our website, uh, which is uh, www.infar.org slash seed, and then you're gonna um, be able to see the events that we've had. Uh, bringing to its uh, end for this year, so this will be the last event uh, to be held this year. Uh, we are organizing this symposium and uh, a more like a colloquium rather uh, for PhD students, but also early career researchers. Um, so it's uh, open to pretty much everyone. Um, and we have had the first session on uh, November 27th, which was uh, uh, chaired by Red and Ratio, he's, he's here and uh, the video of which will be made available in our website. So those of you who have missed that, you can watch it on our website. Uh, so that's pretty much from our end. Uh, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Tanzil Shafiq. I'm a PhD student and also a research assistant at the Informal Urbanism Research Hub at the University of Melbourne. So today we have with us, uh, I'll just give like a very short uh, bio. So. First, we'll have uh, Francisco Bergera Perusic, uh, who's a, a doctor of philosophy in development and planning and directs the research project named Los Arenales City as a complex project towards a grounded theory of informal urbanism. He's the director of Center of Production of Space in Universidad de las Americas in Chile. M Martin, and then we have uh, Mark co-presenting with him would be Martin Arias Loyola, who is a PhD in economic geography and planning studies at uh, UCL London, uh, assistant professor at Departamento de Economia and researcher at the Regional Observatory of Human Development and at the Institute of Applied Regional Economics, UCN. He is currently a visiting academic at the University of Melbourne and he is editor of Academia Ciudadana. Yep, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Okay, uh, so for the second presentation, we'll have Ha Thai, who is an experienced architect, urban designer, and uh, university lecturer working in Vietnam and Australia. He received his PhD from the School of Architecture and Urban Design at RMIT. His research focuses uh, including, include space syntax, urban morphology, building typology, informal urbanism, smart city, and particularly the Asia Pacific region. Uh, thirdly, we'll, we'll be joined by Somia Dasgupta, who is a doctoral candidate in architecture, history, and theory track at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His research focuses on informal urban practices in the context of the 21st century global South megacities. He is a recipient of the Illinois Distinguished Fellowship and works as a teaching assistant for graduate level history and theory courses in architecture. Last, by not the last but not the least is Ishita Chatterjee, our very own, uh, who is pursuing her doctoral studies at the University of Melbourne. Her research focuses on the diverse formation processes of informal settlements in India, where she traces the different urbanization patterns that impact these settlements and studies the growth trajectories they take on account of it. And we'll be hearing a lot more from her. Um, Ishita is also uh, teaching uh, uh, here at the University of Melbourne. All right, so uh, I mean, that's all from me. Uh, Francisco, 
you're on the stage. Thank you very much for having us to me and Martin here presenting part of our research and specifically what was some of the results of being working in an informal settlement in Antofagasta, in the north of Chile. And uh, let me see, that's it. Do you see the full screen of the yes. PowerPoint? Thank you, great, all right. Okay. So, well, uh, give me a second, I need to move. So, co-producing the right to fail, right? resilient grassroots cooperativism in the Chilean informal settlement. That was the title that uh, actually, to be honest, Martin pushed it very much to put that title to this article particularly, because we were trying to defend in a way the, the way how these uh, people in this informal settlement was uh, advancing in the right to the city. And from our perspective as uh, scholars and researchers in the field, we uh, were actually failing a lot in trying to address their requirement of being uh, advancing toward the right to the city. So in this failing uh, process that we had, uh, we learned a lot. So he will speak more in detail about this. I will provide a, a small introduction. Um, so, well, we are first, in, as a context, we are in Chile, uh, this extremely unique uh, country. Uh, a recent uh, study made by Piketty and his team of uh, said that uh, 1% of the Chileans concentrated 28% of wealth. Uh, I don't, I heard some, somebody was asking something or so, uh, no? Okay. Uh, so isn't it, in, the, in this ranking that uh, Piketty made, Chile is one of the tenths most uh, unequal countries in the, in, in the world. So uh, this Chilean miracle that was a name made by uh, Frederick Hayek in the 80s saying that Chile was the, the miracle of this new economics or neoliberalism, if you want to name it in that way, uh, was in, 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 in the numbers at the end, after 30 years of working in that model, uh, is extremely unequal. And uh, is also uh, very oriented to uh, extractive industry, specifically on mining. And Antofagasta, where we were working with Martin, is uh, known as the world capital of copper. Well, that's a name that they want to be, uh, the world capital of copper, because it's one of the, the, the highest uh, uh, amounts of copper extracted from land comes from Antofagasta, actually. So it's very important. And another, and another uh, very interesting thing. So here, here is the, the country, here's Chile, continental Chile. Uh, Antofagasta is here. Here is the city, a long, uh, a long strip in the in the ground in the desert. And it's very funny that some studies said that the the GDP per capita in Antofagasta is similar to New Zealand or, or Korea, uh, which is completely contradictory. I, I will show you how, because in Antofagasta is also the 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 region in the country that has the, the highest number of families living in campamentos. And this increase from 2007 and 2018 is almost 1,000% more people living in campamentos. It's impressive. This is Antofagasta. You know, you remember the GDP of uh, New Zealand and, uh, well, this is the, the reality, the material reality, the things that uh, the economic numbers doesn't, doesn't show you very much. And this is the study case. We are here in Los Arenales. Los Arenales is uh, a, a, a big, the biggest uh, informal settlement in the north of Chile. And here in the right, this animation shows how this informal settlement was uh, set from 2015 to this year. See how fast it grows. And it's quite related to the unemployment in the city. 
So as the, the rate of unemployment was rising, also this, cam this campamento, as the name, this informal settlement, was uh, increasing its, num its number of families living there. So uh, in a way, the failure of the Chilean economy is represented in a, by this kind of uh, uh, spatial formations that are, in a way, trying to find a way to start, stay close to the city. Uh, this is the location of Los Arenales within Antofagasta, as you can see here. Uh, is a 80% of the people living in Los Arenales is are migrants from Latin America. 80%. It's a high, high, very high number uh, in Chile and specifically in Antofagasta. Most of them, most of them, about 75%, based on a on a survey of 2016. Uh, uh, they have formal jobs, so they pay taxes. So it, they are informal because they live in informality, but they are formal for the labor market. So uh, this contradiction situation, contradictory situations, force them to advance towards new ways of uh, getting their livelihoods. And one of the examples that Martin will explain a little bit more is uh, they created a cooperative uh, bakery. As you can see here, these are some of the, the first uh, production of this, uh, this bread that they were made in, in the campamento. So they get some funds from, from, from the government. Uh, they get some help from different scholars. We were part of this help as members of the economic department of Universidad Católica del Norte. So, you know, it's supposed that we were assisting them to this, but we, we, we actually create a mess uh, we need a lot of advisors to help us to understand how to deal with this complex project. And, you know, well, they, they are, at the end, they made it. But uh, we did, we struggled a lot to get to that point. Also, uh, the Slam Dollars International funded some, a project of formation of uh, community leaders. And in the, in the process, we also did a mapping process, a participatory mapping process. Uh, of this macro campamento, we did uh, uh, what is now known as PPGIS, uh, so participatory, uh, I don't remember, <laughs> participatory process of, uh, well, geez, uh, geographic information systems, and to raise the histories of this campamento. So what the people think about every space in this area. What is dangerous here? Uh, what is safe? What has a lot of meaning for them? So we, we did a lot of uh, interesting approaches of mapping through this project. And uh, this is like the line time of, uh, of this formation of this informal settlement. In 2015, Fractal, which is a, a, a NGO, an NGO that uh, formed mainly by psychologists who work in the formation of uh, leadership and working with children in the in the campamento. They help a lot with this uh, installation of la casita, like the small house, uh, which was like a small center of meetings for children to doing different activities after the school and. Then in 2016 appears uh, Rompiendo Barreras. I think I will, be, I will, I will try to go fa faster here. In 2015 is when we get to the campamento. Leilani Farja from the United Nations uh, went to the campamento, was there uh, talking with the leaders, speaking about the problems of uh, uh, human rights related to uh, these informal settlements in Chile, particularly. and. From that point onwards, we were part of the process of advancing in different strategies to uh, alleviate the, the condition of precarity living here in the middle of the one of the driest desert in the world and uh, trying to advance and get a livelihood from that experience. Uh, so I think Martin is you now. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Francisco. So, um, Basically, in a nutshell, so this project was co-created from or started from the Campamento, which is the Chilean word for slum. And they're very proud to call themselves uh, 
slum dwellers. Um, so the, somehow um, we managed the, the whole group and managed to start it, to start this um, bakery, the first cooperative bakery in, in, in Chile, which is um, a very impressive feat because less than 1% of the total Chilean workers uh, are employed in, under a, a cooperative um, firm. So against all odds, uh, it started. La próxima, Francisco. Next. Well, thank you. Um, talking a little bit about what we learned from this process, basically three main things. Firstly, the, the importance of uh, bringing a social innovation into like reality. Um, understood as experimental new ideas with the capacity to spark cultural, normative, or rel uh, regulative changes, reinforcing a society's collective power and improve, improving its economic outcomes, social performance, and resilience. This is um, related with the concept of concrete utopia by Lefebvre, and also with the di diverse economies proposed by Gibson Graham, in the sense that um, the slum dwellers created a, a parallel and diversified economy to the capitalist uh, system in Chile. So this is especially important for um, improving the quality in collaborative and communal, in communal efforts, sorry. And Cosima, bye. Next. Thank you. <laughs> what else? The, the co-production of a cooperative, yeah, I think we, th we also think is very important to stress. And um, since, can you show the next one, Pancho? La próxima. Since he brought together several um, institutions, such as the university, um, what is so, so, uh, such as the university, Cat Universidad Católica del Norte over there, some other universities, some local NGOs, an international NGO, which is the SDI or Slum Dollars International, the national government, the regional government. So um, this project spearheaded this uh, spearheaded, yeah, this um, um, broader network of actors. Which, were like, which all came together in order to make this project happen. And also, this also led to this other project known as the Know Your City, the first one in Latin America. So the Know Your City was in a way a, sub, a byproduct of the cooperative bakery. And la próxima, Pancho. So I, just to finish, um, we think after a, a very painful process of self-criticism that, um, even though as academics, we as academics uh, kind of fail a lot, as uh, Francisco was saying, because we tried or we lacked the experience to um, uh, actually foster this kind of cooperative uh, entrepreneurships within an informal project, because we were just like, uh, we, we had just finished our PhD, so we just, have, uh, uh, we just had all the intentions, good intentions in the world, but we didn't have the, the proper experience. So, uh, we fail in the sense that uh, we, we could have avoided a lot of internal frictions that happen because we were dealing with other issues uh, related to being a, a new academic or an early career academic, such as a lot of political pressure coming from within and outside the university because apparently this project was perceived as a threat to like a more paternalistic way of, um, ways of supporting um, informal settlements. So at, by the end, when we did the, the final assessment, we, like the, the, the NGOs, ourselves, and also the slum dwellers, we came to the conclusion that the most important thing we learned was uh, the right to fail. Uh, by, and by this, we mean that we should, we should propose as academics and so on and so forth, uh, states, state-led policies that promote the rate to fail. So this kind of interactions and networks can actually um, try to bring the, this new and diverse economies into existence. Because uh, since every context is quite different and I don't know, there, there are a lot of challenges appearing, unexpected challenges appearing. And if you don't have that like support uh, from both the state and the university and so on, uh, probably the first time you, you fail, that will be the end of the project. So I, just to summarize that, that was the, the main issue we learned from this project. Can you show the conclusion? Not. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much.
so we'll be taking questions at the end. So we'll just go through the presentation first. So thank you, uh, Francisco and Martin, for that uh, very uh, reflective, I would say, uh, presentation. I mean, reflective on your own work and how it interacts with the community. So uh, next we'll have Ha, uh, taking, from, taking us from Chile to the streets uh, in Vietnam. Right. So, You're yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Now, I have a, a bit, um, I have changed a bit with the titles of my presentation. Um, uh, we, we don't mind, we're all informal here. So. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I just hope that nobody fell off the chairs. Um, but anyway, so I hope that you can see my screen. Yep, perfect. Cool. Right, okay. So I'm going to talk about the, um, the lane way as a marketplace and I will focus on the underlying hidden logic of use of people who use the laneway and share the laneways um, for their um, income generating activities. So before I start, I would like to make some ground understandings on the terms laneways and what is the meanings of the laneway in context of urban planning and urban design. Um, First of all, we come through the laneways. Generally, we know it as a nameless place because, um, you know, the laneway is essentially the place without having any um, significant landmarks or um, other elements um, that make it to become a, um, a significant place according to Kevin Lynch um, in terms of, you know, um, a proper place. And generally, when we talk about the laneways, we refer to a very narrow and tight passageway. And we think about the deteriorating uh, structures and size of properties. And um, we think about the ordinary residents, you know, in most cases. Um, we don't have much um, tourists or the visitors are coming to the laneways because in many cases, the laneway is, is the dead end street. So essentially, people will not take the laneway as a place to visit. And um, there was there was no um, you know through traffic um, that people take the laneways in order to go from one place to the other. Um, so you know in in many cases we um, we think about the laneways as a minor elements um, or sometimes we overlook the laneways when we deal with urban planning. Um, according to the dictionary, um, there's two de definitions of such place. Um, the first term that we often use is the laneway. You know, um, the Merriam-Webster dictionary defined the laneways or lane plus way as a narrow passageway between fence or hedges. Um, so yeah, when we when we talk about the laneway, we we mostly think about the the passageway for pedestrian. And the other terms that um, we all we also often found is alleyway. You know, which is a narrow street, particularly the street that runs through the meters of, this, of the street block and give access to the landlords and the building locating uh, at the rear. Um, so in this presentation, I'll, I'll try not to distinguish between the laneways and the alleyway, but instead I'm going to use them interchangeably and uh, most the, the term that I'm going to use the most will be laneways, because I believe that in most cases the two, the two terms particularly in the urban, in the modern urban planning context, the two term has been mixed and used interchangeably. Um, so generally when we talk about the laneways and the research on the laneway or such secondary street, um, make it really difficult to discern whether the laneway is a public or private property because, you know, it's location, it's in between locations. Yeah. Um, and in many, many cases, um, the laneways is underrepresented in the official maps. So people tend not to map it because essentially they don't, or even the mapper, they don't necessarily have access to that place or that place is so narrow and so complicated to be included in the official maps. Um, another significant characteristic of the laneway would be is um, semi-private and semi-public character, um, which allow informal or even illegal uses of the laneway. And in this presentation, I will focus on 
one uses of the laneway, which is the income generating activities um, that the urban dweller um, conduct in the laneway. Right. Um, so in this presentation, I argue that the laneways is a marketplace in the urban context in Vietnam. Um, so the case study where I'm looking into is the cities of Hanoi, um, where I found that the laneway is a place where ordinary residents working hard to make a living. And um, it, is, it, it is really, really unclear uh, which activities are domestic or which one are, um, are income generating activities. So there is a blur line dividing all those things. And it's really hard to distinguish between the two. So the main focus of the presentation that I present today is a laneway as a marketplace. And I focus on the hidden logic of use. In order to do that, I focus on the laneways in various morphological areas in Hanoi. Um, then I will talk about some of my findings um, regarding people borrow the laneway um, they try to export the business to the potential customer. They subdivide the laneway, they collaborate, and they also compete, as well as they amend and extend the laneways in order to serve their um, income gener generating purpose. The method that I use, so on the map, uh, on the screen here on the right side of the screen, you see the maps of Hanoi. And the method that I use in order to distinguish the laneways from the main street is um, space index. So I use the space index to run the configuration or analysis of the entire city, including all the inner city district. And um, I use a filter systems in order to distinguish between the street that is highly accessible and the street that is poorly accessible. So in the past, in the dictionary really, we distinguish the laneways by subjectively um, analyze or uh, looking into um, its morphological characteristics or its appearance. But um, my research, I use a more uh, mathematical research um, method in order to understand and identify the laneway based on its connectivities and its role within the entire street networks. Um, then Part of the, research, uh, the, of the research method would be um, measuring the distance between the economic activity that I observe to the main street. So essentially, I measure it by using three distances. The first one is a metric distance, so the length between the location of the business to the main street, and the numbers of turn that people have to make along the laneway in order, in order to get from the main street to the business location. So essentially, if the customer move from the main street to the business, they have to make a number of turns, then I count the number of turns that they have to make. Um, as well as in many cases in, in, the, in Hanoi, the laneway is not horizontal. Yeah? It's also go up stairs or elevator. So um, there's another uh, variable, which is the, the numbers of floor difference between the business and the ground floor. But um, this, this is not part of the presentation today. So I will just skip it for now and focus on most, um, you know, businesses located on the ground level. And um, I have about 120 um, samples that I have surveys for this research um, in Hanoi in, dif in five different morphological area. Um, so here show the spatial distributions of all the economic activity that I have surveys in, um, um, in Hanoi. So um, on the vertical um, axis, you see the numbers of turn. So which means that, um, you know, we can see that most of the business located on the ground level um, are, are tend to locate it on the street front, which is um, zero turn and zero meter from the main street, right? So people on the main street, they don't have to make any turn. They don't have to make any metric distance in order to get to the business. So. Um, a significant numbers of, of sample are located on the main street, showing that the main street is a very, very important place. Yeah? Um, but then again, after one turns, we still see a large numbers of business, meaning that um, people still take advantage of being located a bit, um, you know, um, off the street. 
So because after one turn, they essentially still can be seen from the main street, right? Because um, you can, the customer can stay on the main street and they look into the lane way um, and they still see the business side. So which means that, you know, business over there still um, can attract customer. But after two turns, then the location of the business is essentially um, hidden. So nobody can see because you can see after one turn, but after another turn, another angle, then you can't see the business side. Um, but again, after two turn, we I still can find that um, the business still exists over there. Then the significant the numbers of business significantly reduce after um, three turns, meaning that being visible from the main street is very important characteristics. Um, in terms of metric distance, I found that a large majority of the business that, uh, that I survey is located within 50 meter uh, from the main street, you know, 60 meter really. But um, so why 50, 60 meter is really important because um, it related to, um, you know, the working effort that the, the customer willing to make in order to to find the business and to um, and to access the business. So generally, we found that uh, being visible, easy to find, um, which characterized by the numbers of turn, and being cl in close proximities um, to the main street is two major um, determinants that define the viabilities of the business. Um, due to the due to the limited times, I'm gonna move forward on some um, spatial characteristic that allow the business to be um, to be able to operate within the land ways. Uh, so first of all, they many family living in Hanoi they cram in a small uh, house, which is only 10, 15, 20 square meter. Um, so it's really small. So in order to, to conduct a business, then they need to be able to borrow the laneway. So the laneways or the public place um, will be, um, will provide them some opportunity to, to establish and to operate a business. Um, so the example that I'm showing here is an example of two households. They borrow some uh, spacious space along the laneway in order to to put their belonging there, to put some tools and equipment, and um, they conduct some manufacturing activities. Um, then the good that they make will be bring will be brought to the uh, main street space on the pavement and sell it to people. So they essentially, uh, so the the off street uh, businesses link very close with um, the um, you know the activity or the street store located on the main street. Uh, how, just a note that your 10 minutes is up. So, I mean, I mean, if you have like a two minutes for okay, wrapping cool. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. Um, the, another example here showing people that they, um, showing that people can also borrow the laneway. That's the ladies, you know, putting um, her stuff on the laneways. Um, she, she examined the spatial affordances of the place in order to see if, whether she can really borrow it. Um, being able to expose to the customer here, this is a diagram show that, you know, there's a various ways of hanging signs, um, letting people see the, the size of the business and letting people see the activities happening in the place so they can attract the customer. Um, Here's another example showing, you know, a, a smaller laneway that people um, occupy the part of, you know, the laneway corner or the lane corner in order to establish some sort of business there. Um, here, I would like to, to, to speak about this one because, um, you know, in the modern context where people live in the high rise, then the laneways go with vertically. But even when they live in the lane, in such vertical laneway, they still be able to expose themselves to the pools of customer by using internet and technologies. In this case, they sell through the, um, you know, um, Facebook groups. Um, they subdivide the laneway and there was a hidden rule of subdividing the laneways. I can come back to this uh, at the end if we have a question about this one, but um, essentially they, they divide the laneway, they give 
space for people to work. They need they subdivide between the business to the other. Um, so people, you know, um, kind of all um, put the space in orders and trying to to use them and occupy them and make use of them. Um, people also cooperate, but also they also compete in this way. For example, a, a group of restaurants selling street food, other sells drink, and other keep the motorbike for customer. Um, they also amend and extend the laneway in order to um, to give some Wi-Fi clue to people uh, to the to um, their place to the business. So in this case, for uh, for instance, people or some businesses actually located on the second floor, uh, and they use a series of Wi-Fi sign. And even in the high rise here, for instance, people um, hangs um, advertisement sign everywhere in order to help other or the customer to find a way to the business. So that is an example of people hanging signs on the door in the high rise building um, to attract customer. And that's it. Um, the conclusion will be, um, we need to consider Linway as a place because it's always overlooked in the contemporary urban planning approach. And um, you know, um, the Linway has demonstrated its economic significance um, to people, particularly for the one that um, that is the poorer in the society. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Ha. That was, I mean, really nice to look at it. Um, so moving on, uh, uh, Soumya is up. Uh, Do you see my screen? Yeah. Can you go full screen? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, All right. Hello, uh, good evening from Urbana, Champaign, Illinois, USA, and it's evening here. And I want to start by thanking Tanzil and Redento for this great opportunity. The title of my paper is uh, Towards an Architectural History of Informal Urban Practices. And I, I hope that my paper uh, provides some theoretical, uh, theoretically complements some of the very rich uh, substantive presentations uh, that my colleagues presented here. Um, I should uh, start by saying that the discipline of architectural history and theory and professional architectural education at large does not really pay much attention to the global south, let alone informal urbanism. Having said that, of course, other disciplines such as urban planning, geography, and scholars and practitioners with background in architecture do engage a lot with this subject and contribute to it profoundly. Thus, my observation is not, not about all of the architectural fraternity in the larger sense, but about the disciplinary trajectory of architectural history and theory, as I have seen in the current academic environment in the United States, as well as in India. If you do a literature search on databases such as Scopus or ProQuest, you will find considerable amount of research published in the intersection of the keywords post-colonial, global south, and or urban informality with these disciplines um, on the left, but very few published work within architectural history and theory. By and large, still today, even within professional architecture environment, when one thinks about the word architecture, one thinks about buildings, heritage monuments, modernist masterpieces, iconic towers, be it in the global north or the global south. Architectural history still remains primarily the architect text history, the messianic hero figure, often heteronormative male who is Western or Westernized, and most importantly, someone whose chief clientele is the nation state and or private capitalists. Of course, this observation is not new. And it is not that this, not ha this condition has not been criticized from various perspectives. However, it has not been enough to change the idea of what architecture is from a theoretical historical standpoint we really do not have still today an architectural theory of the metonymic slum and other informal urban spaces and their designs. Indeed, this gap is part of a larger problem, which is a lack of a strong post-colonial intervention into architectural history. Western historians or westernized historians who have written about the non-West have by the very weight of the category studied it through what Edward Said has shown as the Orientalist lens. And I refer to works of Sibyl Bozdrogan and Ezra Akkan, who are contemporary architectural historians writing in the intersection of post-colonial studies and architectural history slash theory. So not only don't we have an architectural account of the very different histories that 
shaped the post-colonial global south, we also don't have a scholarship that reflects upon the sense of architecture that emerges from these urban margins. Recent projects of rethinking the canon eloquently captures the state of affairs of our times, and you can see the quote here. It is important to note here that the responses that these authors are referring to follow the model established by Orientalism, which primarily used post-colonial theory to criticize the canon of architectural history, but does not lead to a post-colonization or if we talk about to the decolonization of what architecture is. While groundbreaking projects in the postmodern turn with the rise of the subdisciplinary field of vernacular architecture did acknowledge the architectural forms of non-architects, it has yet not led to a recognizing of the architectural agencies of the very designers of these architectures. Take a look at this uh, satellite image of an urban fabric in Mumbai, which perhaps many of us are familiar with. If you are a sociologist or an urban planning person or a policy analyst with an ethnographic approach, you are surely somewhat theoretically equipped now to understand the different narratives of what is happening on the left side of the picture. But mostly the very scope of architectural history is theoretically and also methodologically limited to the fabric on the right. Now the question is, is why am I concerned about this disciplinary limitation? Why do we at all need architectural history to understand informal urban spatial productions? I present my pretty comment in the two following statements. On the one hand, architectural history and theory falters to accommodate the spatial narratives of unprecedentedly massive informal urbanization processes in the 21st century megacities of global south. And consequently, the contemporary research from disciplines evocatively delving into this topic lack architectural understandings of these processes and spaces. Which brings me to the broader questions, my, the broader questions that I want to frame what I'm dealing with. What is the architecture of the slum? Who are its architects and how do they continuously reproduce such architectures? I am trying to find my way with the help of some critical theorists who can perhaps guide me to reconfigure architectural theory and help answer my questions. In the essay, Science Taken for Wonders by Homi K. Bhabha, he introduces the concept of hybridity in the context of post-colonial cultural production, which also appears in his book, the location of culture, along with concepts such as mimicry, sly civility, and most importantly, the realm of beyond. For post-colonial societal context, I refrain from reducing hybrid as a condition to either mixed slash combined or overlapped or juxtaposed or multi-layered or palimpsest. Because Baba points out a mockery within the project of colonization. Colonizers designed a partial influence for maintaining colonial dependency with simultaneously for Bhabha become the subversive ground of interventions. Thence, colonial power colonized these territories to the extent that it would keep them dependent on the colonial center, but not wholly. Thus, they were never fully colonized, only mimicked some characters and the very mimicry then also freed them partly from the colonialist authority. For Bhabha, as an example, Anglicization is not same as being English. And I, I can, we can compare this with uh, mega cities in the global south trying to become and subscribe to the global city aesthetics, but never really fully become, becoming that. Um, it is not only by entertaining this concept of the ambivalence of power and the ambiguities of subject identity thus produced, can we embrace the concept of post-colonial hybridity, which although an indeterminate concept can be used to read conditions, which in Bhava's terms are almost same, but not quite. And I use this example from Calcutta. It's a, it's a mimicry uh, of, of, the, um, of the Big Ben in London, but it's not London. Lefebvre, in his highly regarded text, The Production of Space, proposed a triad, which many of us are familiar with, where he, where he analyzes that space is produced by a dynamic interrelation of the following categories, spatial practice, representations of space, and representational space. And accordingly, spatial practice embodies a close association with perceived space between daily reality and urban reality. And representations of spaces are conceptualized space, the space of scientists, 
planners, urbanists, technocratic subdividers, and social engineers as of a certain type of artist with a scientific bent, all of whom identify what is lived and what is perceived with what is conceived. And unquote, this is from the Feb. Um, and uh, the third, representational space signifies space as directly lived through its associated images and symbols and hence the space of inhabitants and users. If we uh, take Lefebvre's triad to the slums of Mumbai or favelas of Rio, we can say that the spatial practice is slum making. Representational space can then become, then we can refer to popular commercial films or documentaries or ethnographic accounts of everyday life within the slums. But as an architectural historian, I am uh, most as architectural historian in training, uh, I am mostly interested in the question what, of what corresponds to the representations of space for slums. Who are the planners, urbanists, technocrats, and engineers who design the physical, tangible architectures of the slum? Sertu's deliberations on strategies and tactics, and Michel de Sertu is uh, a postmodern critical theorist writer who, who, who prized to a great extent uh, everyday life, helped me identify, uh, so Sertu's deliberation on strategies and tactics helped me identify the hybrid spatial practices of uh, within this framework. With the term hybridity of strategies, I attempt to capture the idea that multiple strategies juxtapose with one another over time on post-colonial urban space. Residues of colonial planning practices within the state, aggressive development drive of neoliberal real estate, corruptions within political agendas, formal ordering of religious institutions are some of the many strategies that overlap to yield the hybrid strategic impositions that megacities experience. And conversely, tactical hybridity argues that to subvert the dominant hybrid strategic conditions, tactics too proliferate in a hybrid way. Practitioners of informality find or are forced to find quote unquote innovative tactical approaches to manipulate hybrid impositions such as using political affiliations to protect themselves against eviction or bribing the police to continue street hawking. Or we can also, if I may borrow some of the great examples that the earlier presenters uh, presented. So within this framework, I use two concepts which help us help me locate the design spaces of informality and its designers. And this is uh, kind of a conceptual section of, of my field, the field work that is postponed due to COVID uh, in Calcutta, where we see the contradiction of, of uh, or, or the contested situation of the formal city on the one hand, uh, you know, divided by this uh, canal and there is a, there's a slum on the, on the other side and how, uh, you know, a strategic imposition of space is subverted by the tactical hybrid nature of slum production or slum making or what we understand as informal urban practices. Within this framework, I use two concepts which help me locate uh, the design spaces of informality and its designers. Quiet encroachment by Asif Bayat and insurgent architect by David Harvey. Based on his observation on the Middle East, Bayat argued that the absence of traditionally recognized cooperative or collective organizations amongst the urban poor does not necessarily suggest a paucity of grassroots activism. Instead, the urban poor has resorted to an alternate strategy of quiet encroachment. This idea of quiet encroachment as a non-collective strategy of dispersed individuals helped me frame the question, what are the architectures of these quiet encroachments? Who designs these encroachments? And how are they reproduced and redesigned against a regime of evictions, a, re a regime of state-produced formal planning. And by bringing together two seemingly opposite concepts in spaces of hope, David Harvey puts forth the proposition of the insurgent architect, ideating an embodied being who can alter the future locus of city making through strategic and tactical interventions. This helps me situate the slum dwellers and informal urban practitioners as also the very act designers of that informality as insurgent architects whose architectural history remains to be written. And that's the end. Am I on time? Or? It's okay. We don't 
give penalties yet. So. Thank you. <laughs> but all right, I mean, that was very provocatively put. And uh, I, I'm, I really appreciate the breadth that we're actually, I mean, that was the point of putting very heterogeneous material together. Uh, that was the whole point of having, you know, sparking a discussion. So I, I think you have given a lot of uh, talking points for further discussion. Um, but the last presentation then, uh, let's finish that and then we can really open the floor for some uh, more provocative discussions. Uh, so, Ishita, you're up. Hi. Um, it was actually quite interesting to see a conversation about grassroots organization to the everyday practice and, and then Shomo talking about I mean, the entire breadth and throwing so many questions. Um, I'll pick up one of the questions he asked about the spatial practices and you know, how is the architecture of the slum, I mean, how is it produced? And what I found in my study in Mumbai is um, the practices of, of the state, the practices of the mafia, the practices of the urban poor are quite similar. It's the skill which is quite different. So that, that's why I'm going to talk about uh, Shivaji Nagar, which is situated in the poorest ward of Mumbai, which is home to Asia's largest dumping ground, filled with environmentally hazardous industries and is dominated by the minorities, Muslim and Dalit residents. And I talk about how the land the housing as well as the terminology slum, which was given to the settlement, was co-produced. Mumbai's urbanization has been a process of continuous land reclamation and relocation of certain groups. Uh, the land reclamation started in the 1700s when Mumbai was called Bombay and was under British rule. Uh, the first map is from the 1890s, which was the period of early industrialization. The grander areas of the Southern Island were inhabited by the English and a small group of elite Indians. The rest of the islands were occupied by the poor working class and the indigenous communities. It was considered as the periphery. The more land the English captured meant more area to extract revenue, hence started the formidable task of land reclamation. Gradually, the indigenous residents lost their livelihoods and their territory. In 1896, there was the bubonic plague, which had a significant impact on the city's growth trajectory. The development vision of the city during this phase became one to decongest the center. Hence, Trombay Island, which was treated as the physical periphery of Bombay, became the location for hazardous environmentally polluting industries. Even after independence from the Britishers, the Indian government continued utilizing the strategy of land reclamation and relocation of undesirable uses to Trombe. Informal settlements was identified as one such undesirable use. Hence, uh, the ward where uh, Shivaji Nagar is located, Emmy Swat, became the site for relocation of informal residents from different locations in Bombay to make way for infrastructure and real estate projects since 1949. Now, land was reclaimed here through uh, dumping of garbage. Out of the 2,000 tons of garbage that was collected in the city, three quarters was brought here to fill the land. The period between 1970s to 1990s was notable for another process of urbanization, the role of Mumbai's mafias in land development. And this happened due to two reasons. One was the decline of the mafia-operated black markets as a result of liberalization. And the second was the skyrocketing property prices, intense need for housing in an island city with the severe scarcity of land, as well as the steady flow of migrants. Because of this, the, it fueled the entry of Mumbai's organized crime groups into development. So to set the stage, Shivaji Nagar was formed within the context of slum de demolition, relocation, and mafia-led development. Now, this is a slightly zoomed in satellite image of the area from 2000. I would like to draw your attention to two things. One is the concentration of informal settlements in this area. I mean, in a sense, this area became the dumping ground or the warehouse of the city. The second one I would like you to see is the 
uh, re land reclamation that is taken pl taking place at a micro scale. If you look at the yellow boxes, you will notice how land is being produced from the marshland and the lake in these areas. Now, the, I talked about the state-led development and the mafia-led development, and the division between the two processes evident in the morphology. The state's intervention, which was the site and services scheme, was characterized by its orthogonal grid layout and uniform plots, whereas the mafia-led development were on the peripheries of this area. It had labyrinthian street pattern, and it displayed a diversity of plot series and plot dimensions. Now I will be focusing on the 500 by 500 uh, square meter area. And this frame comprises of both the areas which were settled by the mafia and the state. The land reclamation and plotting process uh, was slightly different in the site and services scheme because it was built on dry land that was produced through the extensive land reclamation processes carried out by the government. The plotting involved laying of roads first, demarcating the plots and providing toilets. North-South vehicular streets were designed as the widest, ranging from six to eight meters, and uh, the streets running east-west were narrower at three to four. A shared toilet block serviced each urban block in the center. There were a total of 188 plots within each block, and every resident was given an identical area of land measuring uh, three to 4.6 square meters. In the peripheral settlements, a vast, as vast stretches of land couldn't be reclaimed at once, the process was slow and started from the edge of the lake, gradually moving to the center. It involved digging trenches and rudimentary canals to let the water flow out. The direction of the canals were was perpendicular to the edge of the lake. The next step was the use of garbage to quickly fill up the low-lying areas and dry the ground. The unstable ground stabilized over time, producing flat and dry land where the construction of houses and roads were undertaken. Now, in the case of the site and services scheme, the creation of land superseded the development of housing. In contrast, in the peripheral settlements, land and housing co-evolved in most cases. Due to the inherent instability of the garbage-filled foundation, the everyday lives of the residents in the entire neighborhood, both the state and the mafia-led development, is a continuous battle between sinking land and raising plant levels. However, in the site and services scheme, the shifts in the ground surface takes place at a much slower pace. Whereas in the peripheral settlements, the terrain is much more fluid and undergoes continuous transformations. Now, whenever the areas in the site and services scheme would flood or there would be construction taking place, the state then started dumping those residents into the uh, peripheral settlement. So here, if you can notice the uh, orthogonal layout. So what was happening at this urban scale of you know, socio-spatial uh, peripheralization was also happening at the settlement scale here where the state now started dumping residents from within the settlement to this area. The, so the residents now had to alternate between digging drains to drain the uh, water and later covering the same drains when the water would overflow. The uh, entire neighborhood had been at the margin of the development programs undertaken by the government within the city of Mumbai. Uh, and if there were upgrading projects, they would be only concentrated on the gridded part and it rarely reached the peripheral settlements. Now, the last thing that I would want to talk about is the uh, term slum. Now, this is a site and services scheme. And yet, um, most of the city, even the government, the NGOs who work here, keep on referring it to, uh, to it as a slum. So, the site and services scheme was created during the emergency era in the 1970s. And this was a period that did not require the formal approval of the state planning authority. Hence, this colony did not exist in the official documents. It was, it, though it was planned, it remained unmapped and undocumented for a long period. As a result, it was invisible to the water supply department and hadn't been accounted for while laying out the water pipes. As water problems continued in the neighborhood, the residents from both the site and services 
as well as the peripheral settlements, started accessing water through informal means, which led to the government criminalizing the water supply provision in Shivaji Nagar. Now, along with labeling the water system as illegal over time, the government also started referring to the relocation site as a slum in the official papers. So Lisa Bookman explains that the declaration of Shivaji Nagar as a slum using the Maharashtra Slums Improvement Act was a tactic to provide services. So once a neighborhood gets notified as a slum, it becomes eligible for government improvement schemes. So here, Shivaji Nagar's transformation to a slum was not due to lack of planning, instead it was through an act of planning. The other thing I would want to highlight is the, for the elite and the middle class, this entire neighborhood is a homogeneous entity. It is the slum beside the garbage dump, the stinky, poverty-stricken underbelly of Mumbai. Whereas within Shivaji Nagar, uh, there are multiple territories. I mean, it's just not the morphology of the settlement, even within the peripheral settlements, there are areas where the residents would like to separate and uh, hold on to their uh, different identities. The residents of the gridded colony view the peripheral settlement dwellers as lawbreakers, criminals whose presence has defamed their neighborhood. So the tactics that um, I found in the, at the urban scale of land reclamation, of uh, socio-spatial peripheralization was actually even taking place at the urban scale. And uh, uh, this is what um, Anna Nehra has talked about, how informality gets utilized by the state also. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Ishita. Uh, well, beautiful maps, I have to say. I mean, uh, but, all right, uh, I think amongst the presenters, if you have any question between you know, yourselves, this would be the time if you want to go ahead and ask. Otherwise, uh, I'll take uh, uh, questions. I mean, uh, I see Manas has a, like, we need to do a separate Zoom session with Manas because he has like questions for everyone. So uh, I'll get to that, uh, but, I'd like to go back and uh, what I was like taking notes, I really see the spread of understanding starting from kind of like an economic and social angle and down to kind of like an spatial and uh, a very detailed morphological uh, lens. And, and, you know, what I see is the potential for actually each informing the other and then not seen in isolation. So, Having said that, I, don't, I have some questions of my own, but I'd like to reserve them for later. But uh, I want to start with, we have some of the seed members acting as what Redden calls reactors. Like uh, we're recording this, so you know, that's a bad word to use, not nuclear reactors. But so we'll first start with Stephanie, if you're ready, and uh, for Martin and uh, Francisco. Great, thanks. Um, thanks very much for the invitation and for all the presenters were extremely fascinating. Uh, I feel you've saved the best for last, but don't tell any of the other presenters. Um, so I, I found this presentation extremely provocative and, and especially this kind of concept that you're teasing, around, uh, teasing out around the right to fail. Um, and I had, a, I guess, a sort of like multi-layered set of questions, which don't feel like you need to answer all of those questions. I just, there's a range of things that I was thinking as you were exploring this concept. So thinking about um, the right to fail, thinking about, you know, whose right to fail do you mean in, in that context? Do you mean it's the right of the researchers to fail, the right of um, that community cooperative, the, the right of a co-produced process, you know, which types of rights are you talking about, which types of institutions? Um, also thinking about <laughs> failure is defined in that context. Um, you know, for example, in my own research, I found also sometimes my own failure as a researcher is actually the success of a community group and reasserting its power in a certain way. So also how and whom is defining that failure. Um, and then of course, also um, in that whole range of different institutions that might have a right to fail, how are those uneven burdens and risks of failure distributed amongst those different types of institutions? And then the last thing I was reflecting on, so again, not that you need to answer these all, but something I know we've been talking about quite a lot in SEED also is um, the role of an academic institution and also 
often closing down more, um, closing down a lot of processes and also actually generating a series of failures because it cannot cope with the type of research that we'd like to do. So also thinking about from that very research oriented perspective, what is the role of an institution like a university in supporting processes that will not fail or have a better chance of co-creating something interesting? Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, well, I'll try to briefly respond to like most of the questions. Uh, so more people can keep talking and stuff. So who has the right to fail? Um, or what is fail how is failure de defined? I think, I, I don't know, I would like to start uh, by that because it, it implies a definition and, or a, an overall framework. We thought a lot about this and I think as you, as you said, there are multiple layers about how we define stuff, how we, I don't know, when, when we discuss about the ontology of informal settlements and uh, how we create and produce knowledge and stuff like that. But uh, in a summary, we, most of these discussions, because I didn't have uh, the time to, to say that the paper itself was co-produced. So basically, we didn't do just like the, the, the usual interviews. We, we did the interviews, of course, but uh, we, we presented the paper to like all the actors so they could give, uh, give us feedback. So it was like a, an ongoing process. So that's why uh, in a way we co-produce a, a little bit of knowledge. And those two definitions were or arose from this discussion about what failure is. The first one, the most important one, was related with not being able to uh, achieve the goals that the, the project was um, looking to achieve, or basically not to, or yeah, to fail in the sense that the cooperative bakery will never see the light of day. So that was like the, the main, um, like the main failures, uh, which actually happened because the, the bakery stopped produc production for around two months. And this leads me to the, the second definition of failure, which is the, um, the non-resolved conflict that arose from this highly experimental um, project. So I think we failed as a, like a, a community when we were not able to resolve this conflict, which ended up with the bakery actually uh, shutting down for a couple of, of weeks. So those are the, the two definitions that arose from this, um, from this work. Um, who has the right to fail in, in this kind of experience? Um, and I think, again, this is a very broad question, but I would say, and uh, this is my personal opinion because sadly Francisco is not here, but I would say that um, people who actually try to build a uh, a cooperative and solidarity future, not for not just for themselves, but for their communities, and, and the networks they they develop in order to achieve these projects or to bring these projects into reality. I think, um, so basically, when you shift the, the the focus from a homo economicus to a homo cooperativus, uh, so I think that kind of people has the right to fail and. And most of the institutions participating in this project agree that the state, especially, well, the, the Chilean state is highly neoliberal, but it will be really nice, or the states must um, actually provide policies in order to foster this kind of uh, um, projects. And, and finally, academics institutions, actually, we, this was such an, an issue that we had to write a, a, a separate paper about this because, um, yeah, we had a lot of existential crisis, uh, crisis during the, the process as academics and um, because it was really, really difficult for us um, as an early career um, students or post, uh, PhDs, people with a lot of dreams and hopes trying to actually finally uh, work with and for the people. But so we didn't, well, when we started the project, we were quite naive and I think that's very important because we didn't realize like the political structure of universities, of Western universities, which basically, well, we all know this is a hyper competitive and focus on like production, paper production, stuff like that. So I was the director of this thing called the Ordum, um, the Regional Observatory for Human Development. Um, and actually I had to face a lot of um, 
stuff like um, I don't know how to say politely, but uh, censorship, for example, um, I don't know, a harassment um, for, from my peers. Uh, and I, some of them threatened me. And also Francisco, uh, a colleague actually talked to our boss, like the, the head of the department, uh, asking uh, for Francisco to be uh, fired. Uh, no, it was a point of mess. And on the other hand, we had the local politicians, super right-wing politicians, uh, saying, oh, this anarchist, look at the guy with the mohawk, he's highly suspicious, and the other guy, anyway. So, um, actually, this uh, was helpful for us in order to, well, it allowed us to realize the, like, the actual context of academia, its boundaries. So, that's why, by the end of the project, we were uh, finally able to deal with this stuff because we asked for advice and, and we reached out and and we came to the conclusion that basically at least for me and francisco uh, the whole system like academic system seems quite rotten uh, in the sense that it doesn't allow to uh, do this kind of stuff and, and actually i'm here in melbourne right now uh, kind of running away from my colleagues because the harassment was so bad that actually uh, I, I, at some point I had to decide uh, if, if I stay here in Chile, uh, I'll probably, I don't know, uh, drop academia entirely and do something else and just go and live in the campament or something like that. Or uh, I will run away and try to calm down and, and, and try to actually um, show not just the bright side of academia, like, oh, look at, Look at this project, it's so beautiful, so perfect. No, the try, I, I, I've been trying to make the point with Francisco that um, failure is also uh, useful for us, uh, I, that we should not only focus on the bright side of academia, but also on the dark side. I think that's, at least for me, it's more important. So uh, yeah, that's in a nutshell, <laughs> trying to address all your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. I mean, uh, Martin, that's beautifully put. So. If I had to say that seed had one purpose, it was one of the purpose would be to actually talk about the dark side of academia. I mean, I think that ma makes a very good title for us. Uh, but I think this is actually that space that we don't talk about the research content as to what we're producing, but also the processes involved in that production and how exclusive or elitist it can be or uh, what are the pitfalls? Because I think that is connected to what Somia was talking about is, is kind of like how we historicize and how we actually make narratives. Um, and that's what probably like, uh, I'll actually pick on that when I uh, take the question to Somia, but I do think that Neeraj uh, already has a question for Martin uh, complimenting uh, Stephanie. Uh, Martin, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation and explaining your difficulties as a researcher. So first question I had also same as Stephanie, uh, who failed? Then uh, also I was thinking, uh, as you explained, um, uh, that as a researcher and uh, in collaboration with different organizations, uh, you, you introduced that project in the, that informal settlement in that slum. So I was thinking how the uh, inhabitants, like in the residents who participated in the project, how they um, perceive it, like uh, do they feel like they own it? Do they feel, find that ownership? Uh, or just feel like that project introduced by some outsiders. And, uh, and the same question, like uh, then, then I was thinking like, uh, do they feel like uh, that's their failure or some outsider's failure who came and left? And uh, if uh, that project was uh, successful, suppose, uh, uh, do you think like uh, after you uh, leave, left also, like they would continue that project? Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, for your question, Nira. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. And so basically about the perception of the Los Arenales inhabitants, at the beginning, they were quite um, suspicious about these academics. And well, Francisco did some like seminars about the right to the city, but we quickly realized that we, uh, we were not, yeah, we were not supposed to bring like these abstract theories into the, Los Arenales, uh, but we, in order to like build uh, like um, a, a real relationship, we should sit with them and ask them what they needed from us. So after like uh, the first seminar, 
we had a meeting and actually the Los Arenales representatives, they asked us to do some particular things. So that's how we, we started to build trust, mutual trust, slowly, painfully, uh, through a lot of like small projects. So this perception started to shift. So I think that there are two like um, two processes. Uh, there, there were two processes going on. The, the first one was the perception regarding to us as academics, because most of, as Francisco said, most of the people living here are immigrants. And Chile is a highly ra racist and, and xenophobic country, especially if your uh, skin color is, is, is kind of dark. Uh, so that's a main issue over there. So people living in, in Los Campamentos um, have, have suffered a lot, and most of them are, are women. Um, so that's another issue. So since both of us were men and, and late, well, uh, later, a, a female colleague started to work with us. So that, there was that suspicion. And also there was a, an initial suspicion regarding to the project because people were really um, suspicious about the government. Uh, like since the government, uh, since this was the same government uh, sending the police to beat the out of them because they were taking like control of these lands in an illegal informal way. So they were really suspicious at the beginning. But then um, w by the end of the project, once after, after all this, Mm, like uh, um, struggles and, and breakdowns and, and, and shouting and stuff happened and the bakery reopened like by the end of the project and, and once the, the Slam Dollars International decided to provide funding for this other massive project uh, based on the cooperative bakery um, there was a very uh, strong uh, shift both in the perception and in the interest of the people about participating in, in this project. So a lot of, especially again, women um, were dragged into this project uh, or they were interested about becoming cooperatives, uh, cooperativists, sorry. So that's one thing. And regarding to us, well, uh, by the end of the project, we just became one of them, like in the sense that we, we share meals together and we basically we became friends with most of the, the people working in the bakery. Um, so that was also a good thing. So these boundaries between the academia, the NGO, and the local inhabitants by the end of the projects were completely blurred. We were just people working for the same uh, project. So that was very nice. Failure, um, so yeah, I, I think coming back to the, the issue of failure, I think we failed as, academ uh, as academics when we were not able to properly mediate these rising conflicts because we were dealing with our own stuff. So we fail as academics in that regard. And also we fail uh, in the allocation of time, we, which I think is something we don't talk too much as academics, but uh, we, we thought in a very <laughs> positive way that we were going to be able to deal with all this stuff and, and we, we couldn't do it. And the community sense, well, they, they, at, the, at some point they thought they, they were failing because the cooperative was not producing anymore. And that um, caused a domino effect because um, they also, well, since the cooperative was um, closed for a bit, they stopped like believing in, like in, in the broad project of uh, like the right to the city. So that was like a mini crisis they had to go through as well. But after again, um, some critical evaluation about the process of the bakery and, and their own inner processes, they came to the conclusion that it was worth like trying again. And regarding to the other actors, well, uh, the, the government shift uh, or change from a left wing to a extreme right wing co uh, government. So they basically stopped caring about the project. And, and the, the local NGO um, is still working with the, with the cooperatives. And regarding to the success, I don't remember too much what you said, what you said, like, uh, could you please remember me? If, if the project was successful, like, do you think that it would continue after you uh, leave? Ah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's the beauty of it. Like, since I came here, and, and actually Facebook just showed me some pictures about when the, the SDI project finished, the Know Your City one, uh, it finished two years ago. So after this whole mess happened, um, and we started the, the Slam Donors International's project, uh, that that was also another very stressful um, like process, 
but the, since the community was was strengthened by all these previous experiences, the, the SDI project um, actually helped the cooperative bakery to, to keep producing. And actually right now, these two projects are complementary. So basically the bakery is now, it, it, it has mutated into like a cooperative of several stuff. They are doing, a, well, they're teaching cooperativism. They are also baking stuff. And so basically they have diversified. Um, and this has, this cooperative has also feed, fed into the, the maps they are co-producing by themselves right now. Actually, uh, one of the leaders, the, the female leaders told me today in a previous conversation that they are just about to make their own uh, like census, which for me is completely amazing because uh, they are doing this by themselves. Uh, actually, well, Francisco is in Santiago, I'm here. And so the, the academic group dispersed, but it's really nice to see how they have managed to develop their own skills. So they, they don't need academics anymore. So uh, it's very good to see how the project, how the project had uh, like a, a beautiful uh, ending. Well, thank All you right. very much. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Martin. I mean, that's really good to hear. I mean, how it acted like a seed and you know, how it helped eventually uh, to keep that running. So, uh, you know, we, we are kind of like really out of time but since we're all here and we're going, the discussion, so uh, I'm uh, proposing that we extend, you know, it to kind of like cover all, everyone. Uh, and hopefully that's okay with you. I mean, we are informal. Uh, so next uh, we have a question for Ha from, from uh, Lata. And then uh, also a question from Manas after Lata. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much for inviting me to discuss um, Ha's paper. And thank you for the wonderful presentations, everyone. Ha, fascinating drawings, architectural drawings. I always envy planners and architects for doing that. That's very interesting. Uh, my question is, and it might sound a bit uh, weird, but I don't know about Vietnam context. So when you were talking about laneway, public or private, my understanding is that if it's in the formal city planning, it is supposed to be public, but you were talking about uh, the continuum, whether it's public or private. So do you like that the area you started, was it uh, within an informal settlement or why are you talking about the continuum, public, private? And my other question is about the importance of laneway. So I read um, Annette Kim's book and his work on Vietnam. And I think you might have seen his work. That's really good, Sidewalk City. So he also mentioned about this, that this is really important, the laneway, that's uh, informal vending and stuff. But my question is legally, I mean, is it legal they could do or do they often experience eviction and things from from state and the state actors? And so how do you propose, like, what could you do to if that's the case? So these are my two questions. Thank you again. Wonderful cool. presentation. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the question. Um, first of all, you know, the formation of the laneways and that might get public or private refer to the long historic profile of the laneway itself. Um, so in many cases, um, the, urban the, the urbanization process in Hanoi lead to two things. First of all, the densification process within each street block. So the street block is defined, but then the densification process happens, leading to the fact that more and more people share that street blocks and more and more people live off street, off ground. In order to access to those off street and off ground living places, the residents themselves leave some space as a access way for those people. For instance, a large landlord is subdiv was subdivided by the land owner and sell out to people. Right. And then before he subdivided the landlord, he sort of informally defined some place as a communal or common passageway. And at first, it was 
owned by the group of residents living within that landlord. But due to the needs of people who want to let it pass its way accessible to the customer, it become open, right? In the past, in many passes why many landlords in Hanoi has a door, has a gate at the front, which always closed. And only people living in that area have the key. But then, you know, those businesses, the home buy businesses, they require the passes way to be accessible to everyone. So it become publicly accessible. But in many cases, it's still private property. So it, it become blurrer and blurrer. And over the times when the, the street block is densified, the passes why become public. The second scenario is urban extensions. So people extend the street networks and then they claim part of the lands in the informal process. Over the times after Vietnam became a united country in 1975, the government say that if the land was owned 10 years and there was no debate around or arguments around the ownership of the land, then the people who own the land can have the right to use the land, right? Um, then it become the process since the process why was, which is informally created become something recognized as a part of the street network. So that is the two process that make the, the land wise or the ally wise or passes wise, whatever um, become, you know, blur, sitting in the gray area between the public and private realm. Uh, okay. I think Karina uh, had a very similar question. And I think this, this, this answer kind of uh, answers what she asked as well. Uh, Karina, is that correct? If you're here, because you, I think you asked, pretty much very similar thing. Uh, but I'd like to move on to Manas. You had a question uh, for Ha. I mean, Ha is very popular. So uh, Victor, Karina, Masa, they're like lining up for Ha. So, I mean, I have to disregard some of it just for the sake of time. Uh, I'll be very quick. I'll just yeah. say, essentially what I'm asking in my first question is to say- No, I, I meant the first start... question, yeah. Can we start asking, you know, uh, maybe trying to use um, local colloquial language because it becomes a sort of inherent discursive critique. Uh, so instead of instead of insisting on calling things laneways, alleys, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, relying on you know uh, Western categories of these things, if we if we are able to disseminate and sort of bring into conversation. Uh, colloquial categories and, and terms, uh, they might be more productive epistemologically. Uh, so that's the first question. The second was mainly just saying, uh, what if we, did you consider using sort of, you know, ISOVISTs or some other forms of convex analysis, uh, convex space analysis uh, in syntactic terms uh, rather than sort of looking at integration and choice? Uh so let me just add to that first question. I mean, uh, this is kind of like related to the notion of uh, language of slum as well. So I'm just trying to bridge uh, with this, this notion like so, uh, how, what, it, what it is called colloquially and how it comes about that, you know, how it is produced. So, uh, Ha, would you want to take the first one? Yeah. yeah um, I wouldn't try to define whether the language or whatever is called in Vietnamese is correctly translated. I think my major interest fall into the, the spatial natures of that space and the performance of that space within the broader city context, rather than what is it called. Um, so the term that I use to call the space that I called it is just a way to refer to that space. I rather called it the, the major street and the secondary street um, based on its importance or its role within the broader city street networks rather than what is, what is the right term to call that type of space. I think, so when I say so, um, when, I, when I refer to that space by, by mentioning about the spatial nature of that space, I mean, 
I'm very much interested in the morphological characteristic of that space, as well as the configurational characteristic of that space. And your suggestions on using ISOVIS analysis, um, considering the local um, relation, interrelationship of that space rather than the global interrelationship of that space is actually very, very good suggestions. Um, I have used ISOVITS to analyze this space as well. And that has become, and it, it has, you know, it, it is part of the very powerful um, methodology that I use to analyze such a space. The reason why I select um, what I select and present today is that I'm trying to show that that is a part of the, methodolo the, the methodology which could be used in order to to put a numeric data on um, and in order to use that data to characterize a, um, the spatial characteristic of a place. Because, you know, space syntax has a significant um, weaknesses and we are all part of the community who are trying to improve the method by showing how the method works and what it works well and in, 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 in which context it works well. And the, the method that I show uh, reveal part of the powerful size of space syntax and how it limitation can be overcome. Um, so the research that I use and uh, the, the methodology that I use show that we can use space syntax to measure the accessibility lo of a location. And we can use the method to compare across the city. And we can actually use that method to compare across the country different urban context. So that is the powerful side of it. Um, yeah, I hope yeah. that I answered the question. Yeah, so if we have time, then we'll come back to her because Masa has a very interesting question and Victor has a question related to um, kind of like the politics of methodology. Uh, but uh, let me just uh, go around the room, uh, so to speak. So the next is uh, a question for Somia from uh, Kusa. Yes. Thank Hi. you, Somia. Hi. Thank you, Somia, and everyone for the very amazing presentations. And I think uh, Somia raised many provocative uh, questions and issues, and I really like uh, how you looked at uh, those slums from uh, different domains and multidisciplinary perspective uh, from uh, social science, geography, and urban planning. Uh, I have two questions for you. The first one is related to education, or let's say architecture education in academia. So do you think that uh, there's some, something wrong with the way that architecture, architecture studios and theories are taught in the schools of architecture? Um, and uh, do you think that, uh, what's, what do you think about the role of schools of architecture in general, do you think they would, they should, uh, how, how they should look at slums or how they should uh, look at uh, political issues, uh, especially? Yeah, and uh, the second question, uh, how do you think uh, uh, about uh, the change, how it's happening in terms of adaptation and resistance of residents especially when you showed those uh, beautiful uh, pictures. Uh, uh, there were urban developments in the same, or just next to the slums, high-rise buildings. So how do you think uh, this is changing the practices of the residents and people in those slums? And uh, do you think uh, that uh, politicians in general and the policy is protecting the slums or trying to demolish them. Uh, thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much for the questions. And I think the first question is uh, something that I also struggle with uh, being in, a, in the architectural history and theory discipline, in particular in a university that celebrates um, or rather promotes a professional education in architecture. And I think that applies at least largely to architecture schools in the United States. And, also worldwide. So uh, I try to see where the, uh, when, when I think about that, I try to see where the architecture school fits in, in the larger circulation of global capital. So in, in, 
to in my experience most most students who take up a professional master's course in architecture which is a really hu huge number here in in us at least in my university um are 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 first at the first level they are they, there is a paywall architecture education is very costly you have to take a huge amount of loan to get into a good university and all that and then that the, the university then feeds a, 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 a every year a huge number of architects to uh, to professional corporate architectural firms, and what professional architectural firms produce is not uh, definitely not the slums. They they produce the very architectural typology that is that is the threat to the slums. So they are in in part architects are in a way designers of what we call urban gentrifications. So we, we are teaching architects uh, all around the globe to design skyscrapers, shopping malls, and uh, you know what, I mean, metro stations, airports, high, super specialty hospitals, and um, hotels and all that. But uh, while I have seen from my colleagues in urban planning where there is uh, certainly a, a much bigger awareness about larger political and economic crises around, mega cities, uh, urban planners are then again, not architectural designers, right? And, and the capital flows with the, where the downtown is, where the towers are. So, and in, in that sense, the architecture school really is, in my opinion, uh, in a very, very precarious position. And the way I try to tackle it, which I have just attempted to do in this presentation, uh, is that the reason why that happens amongst many other political and capital interest is that there is an absence of architectural theory, a theoretical understanding of what a slum is. And there is of course no recognition of what I have used David Harvey's category of insurgent architects within architectural schools. So in a way to counter that through my dissertation is to consider the first, the possibility of an architectural history of the slum which then can possibly, in my dreams, make way to architecture school, where people would not only learn about the hist architectural history of the downtown, but also the architectural history of the periphery. So that is overall uh, the, the intellectual endeavor. And I have still not yet done my field work, which I was supposed to do in this time and during the pandemic, it's postponed. But I think in future, I would be able to come up with, uh, you know, an ethnographic evidence or, or some sort of a substantive argument when I actually uh, carry forward my initial studies in, in, in a particular slum in Calcutta. Uh, the second question which you asked that, and, and I think it, it kind of relates to the first question in many ways about how pedagogy shapes practice is that, um, I, I don't think that it, when I, since I use uh, 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 the hybrid post-colonial framework to understand global South mega cities and my approach is like, uh, I have taken classes in many different disciplines to actually understand what post-colonial studies is because there is certainly a very few interaction with architectural history and theory at this moment. Uh, so I think that it is difficult to, uh, point fingers at whether the politicians want the slums to be there or they don't want the slums to be there. It's, it's kind of very, you know, it's a, it's a precarious pos uh, position or a condition in that sense. It's for, for a city like Calcutta, which I'm very familiar with because I grew up there, slums are used as a, as a, as a way to generate, and this is true for, uh, in, a, in a very Marxist sense, it's true for many slums is that they are the generator of this surplus labor on which the middle class and the, and the urban uh, upper, upper middle class who, who practice their everyday urban life. By, and, and, and urban life for the middle class in global South mega cities are subsidized by labor from the slum, be it the construction workers or housemaids or rickshaw pullers or you know, vendors who, who are not protected and uh, you know, so in that sense, the city needs the slum, and this has been theorized from urban planning perspective as well. Uh, much earlier, like Ishita was mentioning, uh, Ananda Roy, who is like we all perhaps refer to her, is that the state uses urban informality in its own way. 
Um, but at the same time, the particular site that I showed, the towers in the picture are, are coming up and they are in, in the process of defining that particular urban periphery in Calcutta, it's in the eastern part. And it is leading to a gradual displacement, not a direct displacement of the slum, but a gradual displacement of the slum by you know, raising rents. And while these have been very thoroughly studied in geography, in urban planning, I think my purpose is to bring architects and like hold architects responsible in, the, in this transaction on, on this violent transaction of capital within space. So, so that is what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to talk about anything new, but I'm just trying to put the focus of the question into architectural practice and architectural education. So that would be my very long answer uh, to your question. Yeah, all right. Good Thank luck you. with that attitude of getting a job at an <laughs> architectural theory and history department. <laughs> uh, you will do great, yeah. So uh, we kind of like close to the hour. So let me take the final set of questions for Ishita from uh, uh, Reva and Redden. Reva, do you want to go ahead? Oh yeah, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to scroll up because that was a while ago. Uh, yeah, I mean, great discussion even in the chat box. Yeah, the discussion. There's a there's a my the current favorite word is asynchronicity, and there's an asynchronicity between the discussion in real time and the discussion in chat. Um, I think I had a question about like. The, so right. I can read it out. I can see your question. I, you... I also remembered. I also remembered. So okay, okay. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was excellent. And, and I used to drive past Shivaji Nagar for like three years um, before I came here. So it, 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 it like I had those feelings like it was a big, big chunk for me. That's it. And that was like, that's it. It's there. Like you said, for people outside, it's like one big block. And uh, the question I had was that, like, did you think that the categorization of slum was a way of grandfathering it instead of having the formal planning that was already done being the pathway for accessing services. So since you can't get it done through the straightforward normal means, was that the way of uh, then saying, let's grandfather it in because clearly like putting it on a document doesn't work. Um, you've also asked me whether uh, the location beside a garbage dump diminished his visibility. Yeah. 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 So, in in the case of Shivajinagar, the uh, the state's planning method was very different from the starting itself. Uh, one is the land wasn't given to the residents. the The government owned the land. It was uh, so the residents uh, rented out. So, so the government was the owner, and it's also the planning. Um, tactics, which is so different from the rest of the planned city, I would say. So here, it, it is not the location beside the garbage dump which reduces its visibility, it stigmatizes. And uh, uh, Lata, Neeraj, and Redden, and I, we have been uh, writing something about the politics of unseen, which we say is something that creates this visibility, invisibility. So here, it is unseen because government is aware of that uh, of the settlement. And uh, um, I, I think from the starting, the government knew that this was supposed to be something different from the formal development, even if it was planning for it. So I don't know whether um, uh, by calling it a slum, and some of the arguments that researchers who've been talking about uh, this settlement asked the government officials that why do you call it a slum when you have uh, called it a, re a resettlement site? If the government has the power to call a resettlement site a slum, doesn't the government have the power to provide uh, water to it without calling it a slum? So then they would always talk about the image of the settlement, that it looks like a slum. So nobody called it. And then there was a lot of other reasons given that it never made it to the planning documents. But if the government, I would just argue that if the government can use informal means to call things slum, why can't it also undo it? And um, um, may I just quickly go to Redden's question about the mafia, Tanzel? 
Uh, I mean, other people might not know the question. So Redden, oh, just okay. quickly ask. Yeah, yeah, so just very quickly, because is she I the mean, math? Is it that you realize that you had the most time to prepare for the questions? So better be good. Yeah. Okay, Redden, go ahead. Yeah, so Ishi, the mafia has a very unique political and historical roots in the U.S. and, of course, in, in CCD. But uh, why did you use it to describe a group of stakeholders in Mumbai? How does it uh, affect the urban development in that part of Mumbai? And in my own research in Manila, mm -hmm. groups with, you know, informal structures of power, they are not totally devoid or completely autonomous from state influence and state processes. So to what extent do mafia stakeholders, mafia stakeholders in Mumbai contend or collaborate with state actors and state practices? I use the term mafia because that's the term that is colloquially used. It is used by the residents, it is used by um, journalists, and it is used by everybody. Now here, uh, in Mumbai, at some point, the mafia was equivalent to an organized crime group, where at, I think it, that was during the 1970s, and it was equal, I mean, very similar to the Italian mafia. However, over time, um, that definition has changed because the mafia's role has changed, the mafia's composition has changed, and the tactics have also changed. Now, I am not sure currently what is the status. I mean, all the things that you're asking me, this is heavily like under-researched for reasons we all know why. Um, so it's only um, through whatever I've read that right now, it, the scale of the mafia is not at the level of the Italian mafia, but however, it is a gang, a dominant gang who has powerful connections with the state. So there is a blurring of these two different groups of mafia and the state. And um, the term mafia is also used in different other, uh, different parts of uh, India. In Delhi, uh, they are called land mafia. In Bangalore also, they are called land mafia. In Bombay, you have the term garbage mafia, water mafia. So the prefix that gets added, is based on what they control. So the term mafia is also uh, an equivalent of a dominant authority who is not the state or who is not really legal. It's like a mafia nuovo. So it's like a local syndicate outside the formal and, and the, of power. And the mafia also is different from, diff uh, from state to state. So it has also changed over time, over the course of history, but is also different from state to state. And I think um, so, uh, in Mumbai, I have noticed um, the morphology of the settlements has a similarity when, when they're within Mumbai and when they're outside Mumbai, the, the satellite cities and the districts. And probably there is a connection between uh, the administrative boundary of the mafia. I don't know if it overlays very neatly with these, but I start to see a very different morphology of informal settlement. And, but these are things that it's beyond my capacity to find out. So I'm so sorry, I will be answering this in a very poor manner and probably only speculation. So guys, this is also a time we can say that, you know, Ishita, you're going back to Mumbai. So you get more, uh, you can do more research and, uh, this video will be available online, so the mafia probably will get in touch with you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but I mean, uh, unless there are any particular questions that someone wants to raise now, uh, I'd like to actually draw it to a close. I mean, we are over, uh, we scheduled for one hour, 15 minutes, but we're over by 45 minutes. Uh, but I think the discussion has been quite interesting and, and, and really uh, across so many disciplines and so many methodologies and so many experiences. I mean, you guys have been there and, you know, and, and that experience trumps uh, all other stuff. So just as a kind of like a closing note, uh, thank you to all the presenters and thank, thank you to all the reactors and thank you to all the audience. And uh, we will be uh, closing for this year, but, uh, 
space for engagement and epistemic diversity seed. We'll be back next year with uh, a lot of new presenters. And we we'll also uh, would like to actually take this beyond Australia as well. I mean, this was our first step to internationalize. Redden, would you like to uh, add, add a comment on that? Uh, yeah, so as I said last week, we are going international, guys. Hopefully by next year, we just have to iron out some details with the uh, infer with Kim and Krista, but we'll definitely keep you updated about the uh, plans for next year. So all those who attended the uh, two panel sessions last week and today would be included in our international seed mailing list. So you will receive regular updates as well as the plans for next year. Thank you everyone for this really great uh, session and for all the questions. And I think as to what seed we'll be talking about, I mean, today's discussion is a great example of that. It is all things research and not just content. It's not what knowledge we produce, but also the political economy, let's say, of that research. And then the, the, the social aspects of the research and what we feel as researchers and all the things that we don't get to talk about in academia, all the methodological issues that probably are under the surface and never made clear by our professors or, uh, or you know, the ethical issues that we face, but that never gets addressed. So we are kind of like, we want to test the limits of academia itself. And we are the early career researchers. We'll, in 10 years time, we'll be probably in a place that we'll be able to make a lot of decisions. Uh, and I think this is the space that we want to foster those discussions so that it shapes the way we think and we learn from each other. I mean, basically, at the end of the day, it's a horizontal learning platform. So with that, uh, we like, uh, you know, we draw an end to this and we'll see you next year. Uh, and thank you so much for your support and bye-bye uh, for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. See you next year. Bye. See you, bye. Bye, bye guys. Yeah. 2020, just like, should just leave. I mean, enough of 2020. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ha um, and Somia. It was really a great session. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shomo. Right. Yeah, I yeah, I also worked um, with the Lefus uh, tribe. So yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah. yeah. To see how you used. Yeah. Uh, hi Noshin. Did you wanna turn on your camera just so we can meet you. I know that you're also from Bangladesh, so oh, okay. Pencil and uh, Yeah, yeah we're from Bangladesh. From Bangladesh. <laughs> and I guess Shomo uh, is from Kolkata. Somia is from yes. uh, Kolkata, so